Hi. Welcome to Study Queensland webinar series. Um, good afternoon and thanks, uh, thanks very much for joining today. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Tak Adachi. I'm the uh, Queensland Trade Commissioner for Japan based in Tokyo. Today, we are very excited to talk about opportunities in Japan at this special webinar uh, organized by Study Queensland. No doubt, we are all dealing with the challenges and complications presented by this pandemic. But I want to reassure you that TIQ Japan team are here to help you despite these uncertain times. I know this pandemic has affected the international education sector enormously. Today's main topic is how the Japanese education study abroad market is adapting to the new normal, uh, new normal including a discussion on online uh, education. First, I'd like to give you a big picture rundown on the Japanese economy and how the, what it means for Queensland, including the, uh, the COVID update uh, in Japan. Then I'll turn to our BDM for education, Yuri Forsyth, to give you an interesting in, uh, market insight and update, including a recent survey done on Japanese study agents. So please try to uh, stay for an hour with us. Uh, there are a few uh, um, housekeeping matters. I'll share the, some slides with you. Um, let me have a look. Sorry. Yeah, so the housekeeping matters, excuse my, uh, not adapting to the environment, the uh, online environment 100% yet, but um, housekeeping matters, uh, your microphones are muted uh, this session will be recorded. Uh, and um, in terms of questions, uh, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box um, in, on your uh, Zoom screen. We'll, we'll try to address them privately or at the end of this talk, uh, talk session. Hopefully we have sufficient time to answer some of them. Um, then don't forget, uh, please um, uh, feel free to reach out to, to us, TIQ Japan, and, and study Queensland team in Queensland. So let me start with my slides. Now, just on the COVID update, um, we, um, as you probably heard about this, but um, I think the Japan's exposure with COVID started in February, early February with um, uh, uh, Diamond Princess, the cruise ship um, situation. <clears throat> By <clears throat> late February, February um, the government started to address uh, these issues um, and including the closing the schools pretty early um, for, for uh, COVID, uh, to avoid the COVID uh, um, uh, situation at schools. In late March, the IOC announced the uh, Tokyo Olympics will be postponed. And uh, on the 8th of April, the Japanese government called the, um, announced the state of emergency. So as you, have, as you can see on the graph that the peak has, um, we have seen the first peak in April and down to May. On the 25th of May, uh, the state of emergency has been lifted uh, by the Japanese government. Uh, and on the 1st of June last, uh, last week, um, the schools, uh, prefectural schools uh, in Tokyo and a few other, uh, other um, prefectures have been reopened. In the meantime, the Japanese government has been announcing uh, a very large uh, financial uh, package um, uh, similar to any um, yeah, developed countries like uh, Australia to address the issues for household and small businesses 
as well as large businesses. Now, the, I'd like to talk a little bit about the impact on the Japanese economy. Um, as you can see on the graph that um, Japan's uh, first quarter GDP has been, has already seen minus 2.2%. Two, 2 um, actually, we had a consumption tax hike in late last year, so that's actually uh, two, quarter of, uh, two quarters of uh, neg negative growth puts Japan into recession officially. And then I'm sure that the third, uh, the second quarter, which is the um, uh, April, June, is going to be a pretty hard number as well. But we are feeling the impact in terms of spending and uh, capital expenditure and so on. But interesting to note that the inbound tourism number has been almost, you know, down to zero, uh, by, down by 100 percent. So um, obviously Olympics was expected this year, and uh, I remember only late last year some of you were in in Japan on the trade mission and we we're talking about Olympics um, and uh, which was supposed to happen next month. I'm, our employment rate uh, situation, Japan's, um, at the, the current rate is about 2.6%, um, very high by the Japanese, uh, uh, the, the historical standard, but it's still very low compared to many other countries. We're talking, you know, obviously job market affects the education demand as well. So I just wanted to highlight that. A couple of um, interesting observation uh, and anecdotes from blue chip uh, Japanese, you know, Japan Inc. What's happening? Why are we talking about this? It's, it's education is all about talent and employability. And uh, we wanted to see what the, you know, employers are, are feeling in terms of the impact. The companies like Toyota, Nissan, um, and and ANA, uh, obviously they're feeling a huge impact in, on on their bottom line. Uh, transport sector, uh, airlines, uh, tourism sectors, uh, tech sector like SoftBank also seen some huge uh, losses. However, there are some um, winners and early adapters. Uh, probably not to the extent of Zoom or um, Netflix or Amazon in America, but company like Nintendo, I'm sure that some of you have probably bought the Switch games uh, during the lockdown to keep uh, kids entertained. They're seeing a huge increase in sales. Uh, blue chip Japanese companies like Sony, uh, Sharp, Hitachi, NEC, those um, those guys are now adapting to COVID environment using their manufacturing uh, know-how and um, technologies to, to move into the new area like healthcare uh, sector. Um, and in companies like uh, Uniqlo, who you, some of you are well aware, they are even coming up with um, uh, face masks to um, suitable for the summer using highly uh, breathable material. So that's that's an innovation there. Uh, and e-commerce, uh, Yahoo Japan seeing a huge increase in e-commerce traffic uh, like many other countries. So there are interesting paradigm shift taking place during the COVID and that will obviously sh um, uh, will should impact the skill demand and reskilling opportunities for, uh, for the education sector. Japan's cash reserves, um, according to Bloomberg, is highest at the end of 2019. So Japan Inc. is cashed up, uh, which is good news because uh, times like this, it's better to have a high cash position. Um, good to know the, the graduates of uh, Queens and education will have a potential jobs in the, hopefully in the Japanese, uh, um, um, the corporate world. Japan's the third largest foreign direct investor in Australia. Um, so it's, uh, it's got a huge uh, impact on that. Um, turn to, turning to Jap uh, the um, education picture, uh, Japan, uh, well, Japan loves Queensland. If you can see this graph, Queensland uh, has had the highest number of enrollments since 2017 compared to many other, compared to um, all the other states. Um, so the Queensland's positioning in, in Japan for all sectors are pretty, uh, looking very good. So we want to maintain this branding and, and, and so on. The way 
that Queensland and Australia have managed the COVID situation. So we are, uh, we can continue to promote uh, the, the branding of safe destination. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, all sectors are very good, uh, particularly electrical and vet. Um, this is a study tour uh, for the uh, government school. Again, Queensland dominates uh, in Japan. So, you know, the more high school students come to Queensland and we look after them, hopefully we'll um, have a repeating businesses in all sectors. Now, um, as you know, Queensland um, has had a lot of strategic relationship at the government to government level. Uh, in Japan, uh, for example, Saitama is a sister state for 35 years. Uh, we have a number of relationship with, with Saitama. Uh, in recent years, we have developed a, a stronger, re strong relationship with Tokyo, uh, Kyoto and Hiroshima uh, governments, as example. Uh, at the city levels, um, um, we also have a very strong relationship at, you know, between city to city <coughs> relationships. Um, I know the Gold Coast is very strong with Kanagawa, uh, Ipswich, Nerima, and so on. So at this, uh, you know, Japan relationship with Queensland, particularly in education, uh, it's got the history and uh, um, uh, it's, it's, it's got the resilience in, in the relationship. Now, um, I'd like to turn to R&D and then corporate uh, talk again, uh, because I think this is gonna be a very important part of our journey, um, school sector, all the way up to the research collaborations at the corporate level. Uh, we, wanna, uh, we wanna see Japan to play even, uh, uh, even more, um, a, you know, a key role in contributing to international uh, research collaboration for Queensland. This is a great example. QT has done really well in Japan. Uh, this is not just between university to university uh, relationship between QT and Tokyo University, which is the number one university in Japan. But behind that, through green hydrogen, which is very topical uh, um, uh, export opportunity for Queensland, um, we you know, they, we have dis developed a very strong corporate relationships with companies like Sumitomo. So the graduates from Queensland will eventually be able to um, be recognized and respected in, uh, in um, corporate world in Japan. Um, I'd like to also talk a little bit about regions because I think COVID, one, this is my work, personal take of this um, COVID is that um, you know, people are moving, potentially moving a lot of uh, operations out of the big cities and crowded cities like Tokyo and moving to regions. And I'm sure that similar kind of uh, uh, movement will happen around the world. So the beauty of Queensland is that we got uh, a variety of uh, regional uh, uniqueness and opportunities. Um, Japan in, in TIQ Japan, we want to continue to promote that aspect for, for, um, for uh, building a new relationships. Uh, one good example is this um, uh, Bowen uh, region um, has developed with uh, Japanese government funded um, organization for training farmers, uh, future farmers. And as you know, in the Japanese farming, is very much small scale um, in terms of land size. Australia has a very different, uh, more sort of a highly uh, efficient system. So they are um, started to come out to uh, Bowen to study how the Queensland and, and the Bowen region does uh, well with agriculture. So with this sort of training, hopefully in the near future, we, we, we can, we, can uh, we hope to see Bowen mangoes and tomatoes will be uh, at all supermarkets around Japan. So um, cross-selling to me is very important. It's education to me is, is obviously a one opportunity, uh, working with other export sectors like agriculture and the other ones, mining sector, uh, green hydrogen, we can really showcase uh, the Queens and teamwork and then uh, depths of uh, opportunities. 
So um, on that note, uh, that's the end of my presentation. And now I would like to introduce um, my BDM for education, Yuri Forsyth, uh, to, uh, to give a presentation uh, on her part. But I just wanted to quickly mention that the beauty of our team is that we have, you know, everybody, pretty much everybody in our team has been exposed to Queensland education and the Japanese education. So we're on the ground, we've been on the ground for a long time to understand both sides and um, having a kind of local eyes. And then, but yet we understand how Queensland sees Japan. So with that sort of a background, we want to uh, bring those opportunities together to, to, um, to create more outcomes. So thank you for your attention and I'll probably see you at the end of this session for during the Q&A. So over to you, Yori. Hello everyone. Thank you, Tak, for the wonderful introduction. Um, so hello everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Yori Forsyth. I'm the business development manager for the education sector here at TIQ Japan. Um, a little bit of background about me, as, as Tak mentioned, I'm half Australian, half Japanese. Uh, my dad hails from Queensland. I actually was educated on the Sunshine Coast. So if any of you are from the Sunshine Coast, um, hello to you. And also my mother is Japanese, so I've done a lot of education here in Japan as well. So today uh, I'll be sharing with you an update on the education sector in Japan during and post COVID and introduce to you some uh, current trends and opportunities um, in Japan at the moment. So I will share my slide. Okay. So as Tak mentioned in his slides, uh, Japan is and will continue to be a key source market for Queensland's international education sector with Queensland topping as the most preferred Australian state for Japanese students since 2017. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Australian border closure forced many Japanese students studying in Queensland to return prematurely and halted almost all international study plans until further notice. Um, domestically in Japan, the pandemic caused most schools uh, in Japan to close for three months or more. The schools in Tokyo only started back up this week. Um, so this resulted in a spike of increased demand for online and digital learning platforms. Though in reality, many schools and local uh, government boards in Japan struggled with the take up of ICT resources, which ultimately exposed Japan's lack of technological literacy in education compared to many of the other uh, developed nations around the world. So in this presentation today, I'll be deep diving a little more into the reality of this tech situation in Japan, specifically in education, as well as introduce some new emerging themes that have come out of this pandemic. Um, I will also talk about the results of a recent survey uh, that TIQ Japan conducted on education agents, study agents in Japan that a lot of you probably work with already. Um, to get a, a bit of an idea on what the Japanese education professionals are currently feeling and the future prospects um, that they feel as well. So these results, uh, which I will explain in more detail later on, uh, suggested that demand for education, demand for international programs such as study tours and study abroad have not significantly decreased. And I will um, introduce some emerging opportunities that have been suggested or proposed uh, by them as well. Um, lastly, I will close the presentation with some pointers on what um, Queensland education providers such as yourselves can do at this time to ensure a, a smooth transition back um, to a robust international education sector in the future. Uh, so I would like to, again, just remind everyone participating in this webinar to please feel free to ask questions anytime using the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will either be able to answer these during the session via written answers within the thread. Um, other, otherwise, we will have some time at the end to, to answer these verbally. So please don't hesitate to send through any questions you have regarding our presentation. 
So without further ado, I would like to move on to the next slide. Okay, so I would like to touch on some emerging themes and changes that have happened in Japan in the last couple of months as a result of this pandemic. So firstly, the prolonged school closure uh, has intensified concerns that inequalities in education are growing within Japan, um, which has ignited talks on a proposal to change the start of Japan's academic year from April to September, with the final decision expected to be made in mid-June. According to the latest news, which came in this week, um, it was said that Prime Minister Abe has expressed that it would probably most likely be difficult to introduce this change within this fiscal 2020 or fiscal uh, 2021 as initially planned, but that, that, but that they would look uh, further into the possibility of introducing the transition over a five year period, possibly. So the, this move took into account uh, voices of concern about the potential disruptive effects of changing the enrollment system, um, such as possible increase in the number of children on school waiting lists and a delay in the start of compulsory education, as well as financial burdens on families and schools um, that will be affected by this change. But initially the proposal to change this entrance exam, uh, entrance school academic year period um, was proposed um, was thought to bring advantages such as bringing Japan in line with the global standards, uh, making it easier for future study abroad between Japan and international destinations. Also, it would change the entrance, uh, the university entrance exam period from mid-winter to summer, which would mean less students fall sick during the season. Although with the, uh, the global standard that they're claiming is mostly referring to the US, um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, where this discussion will go and how it may affect the study abroad changes for Australia in the future if this change does occur. Secondly, uh, there, there are, there's an increase in demand for internal internationalization. So where universities in Japan are looking for ways to globalize the institution without having to send their students abroad. So this is done by things like increasing English classes within their curriculum, increasing scholarships for incoming international students and increasing international programs domestically with local foreigners and refugees. Thirdly, this is a relatively new debate that has slowly started to ignite in Japan and has got to do with the environmental impact and carbon footprint of international education and mobility, especially related to short term uh, study. So these environmentally conscious discussions are pushing to reducing short term travel and moving these activities online. So this would be interesting to see um, how it will affect the study tool market going forward as well as Queensland is dominating there and we don't want to lose that obviously. So going on to the next slide. Um, there are a lot of conversations now among institutions in Japan questioning the meaning of study abroad and discussions um, on the need to restructure study tour, study tour and study abroad programs going forward. So we may, we, us, Queensland, um, we may need to look at ways to reform the existing programs to see how we can leverage on new opportunities from increased digital platforms. Um, these include having some value add aspect in the existing programs, especially taking advantage of the limited time difference um, that Australia enjoys with Japan. For example, having like a pre or post uh, online session or collaborating um, in projects between institutions prior to or after the study tours to make the program more attractive or I guess to justify the short travel. So I know some institutions in Queensland have had already started doing these kind of in-depth collaboration projects with um, your partner institutions or with government bodies in Japan, but these might become more essential going forward. And um, lastly, I touched in the introduction, this pandemic has exposed Japan's lack of digital literacy in the education sector compared to other countries. And I would like to share with you some eye-opening statistics that have come to light on where Japan is at digitally in education. So, firstly, on the right of the slide, this is a survey conducted on Japanese high school students during the COVID-19 school closures, um, comparing the responses from government school students and private school students. 
So while 98% of all schools nationally in Japan were closed um, in Japan between March and May, it can be seen here in the red box that only 26% of private schools in Japan actually conducted or resumed lessons online during this time, while the government schools are even lower at 9%. So this means that while most other countries had at least resumed their curriculum online during the school closures, most Japanese students had spent this time either doing revision work that the school had handed out on paper or external um, lessons provided by third party providers for households that could afford that. Um, so this is mostly due to the lack of ICT environment at home for many students in Japan. So there was a staggering statistic that was released by OECD earlier this year, comparing the average 15 year olds around the world and their use um, of laptops. So Japan has scored the lowest with 35% of students using or owning a laptop at home. Um, on the same study, Australia had scored 85%. So you can see the vast differences there. Um, I have included some examples on the left of this slide on how sub board of education in Japan have tackled the online world during the school closures, such as some collaborating with private providers um, and outsourcing online lessons, some BOE starting a YouTube channel to record lessons for students to watch um, during the lockdown, to some like Tokyo Board of Ed Education, for example, collaborating with Microsoft to try and allow as many students to access online learning but the reality is the take-up has been painfully low for most government schools in Japan. So moving on to the next slide. So the statistics here um, on this slide was released by MEX, the, the Ministry of Education, and compares the classroom ICT usage in junior high schools across international OECD locations. Um, as you can see how Japan comes second last at 18%, while Australia stands third at 80%. This next slide uh, shows the difference between the interest from Japanese students on wanting to use computers in the classroom versus the reality of how often they are actually used in the classroom. So if you look at the graph on the top, this is how many primary school students and junior high school students in Japan want to use devices in the classroom. So you can see in primary school over 80%, in junior high school over 70% of students want to use um, these devices in the classroom. But the reality is, if you look at the graph on the bottom, for primary school, only about 10.4% um, of students are actually using them in the classroom, and it's even lower, 7.2% for junior high school. So this showcases the struggle of a lot of the Board of Education offices um, around Japan implementing ICT environments in their school. So this is just another graph comparing OECD countries and their ICT usage in schools, showing Japan coming last um, at only at around 10% of schools using computers in the classroom, even one to two times a month. On the same scale um, on the left, you can see Australia coming in fourth in the world. So lastly, with statistics, this was the most shocking of all for me, showing digital device usage for Japanese students outside of the classroom. So if you look at the statistics um, on the top inside of the red box, um, on the right, it shows while over 87.4% of Japanese students use the internet and ICT devices such as smartphones um, to chat to friends and play games, this, is, this was significantly higher than the OEC average of 67.3%. But when it comes to using these same um, devices and resource, digital resources for educational purposes, such as doing homework or assignments, if you look at the graph on the left, the statistics were as low as 3%, which is significantly lower than the OECD average of 22.2%. So this shows that Japan um, may enjoy an international reputation for innovation, but this does not extend to the educational sector at large. So the reasons for the reluctance of schools going digital inc include concerns about equality. So as you saw in the previous slides, not all children have access to digital technology or even Wi-Fi environments at home. Um, and governments don't like to implement programs that may disadvantage some students over other students. 
Also, it has been said that government, um, governments and schools are concerned that children may see inappropriate content if they have access to a computer. So this was the reality of Japanese education pre pre COVID-19. However, the pandemic has forced or is forcing the Japanese education uh, sector to change. So here I show you some new and emerging keywords that have come up in the last few months, mostly used by education agents and institutions here in Japan. So these include words like online study abroad, um, or the obvious edtech um, and COIL, which stands for collaborative online international learning. So online study abroad programs have been launched by many of the education agents uh, during this time to cater firstly for students who were essentially stuck in Japan. So for those students who had planned on traveling abroad to start high school, for example, with the intention of graduating, but was unable to travel um, and therefore could not start their course. So some schools overseas, including schools in Queensland, could not cater for these international students online to start their courses online. So these students had no choice uh, to either, but to either defer their enrollment or re-enroll to a completely new school um, who was able to cater for them. Um, and COIL, uh, as many of you in the international education um, sector may already know, um, is designed to connect and and learn with students um, at international institutions uh, using systems like Zoom or other video conferencing or social media platforms. So also, also this new initiative launched by MEX, the Ministry of Education in December last year, 2019, um, the GIGA School Program was launched with the aim of supplying digital devices and international sorry, in internet environment, Wi-Fi environment to every student in Japan by the end of 2023. But due to the pandemic, this initiative was brought forward to be completed by the end of this year. Um, as you saw in the slides before, statistics show that currently only around 35% of students in Japan actually own a laptop. Though having said this, we know that laptop sales significantly went up during the corona periods in Japan. So the statistics are probably much higher at this point in time, but this move by MEXT, this initiative is a necessary one and hopefully will close the gap between Japan and other nations when it comes to ICT usage in classrooms going forward. Okay. So a little more on the brighter side. So this next slide shows a recent survey uh, conducted by our office on major education agents in Japan that we work closely with, many of whom you probably work really closely with as well. So these are responses compiled from around 30 or so of these um, study education agents in Japan. So as you can see, um, the first question on the left was, I am optimistic about the international education industry after COVID-19. For this question, more than half of the responding agents responded with either yes or neither, which shows the demand um, or desire for international programs after COVID-19 has not significantly decreased, but it should be noted that there were response discrepancies between agents focusing on different types of study abroad and that the responses were significantly uh, pessimistic for agents specializing in short-term or group study tours. The second question um, on the right was, I believe there are new opportunities to study abroad um, that arose due to COVID-19. So responses to this question was also very promising with over 70% of agents feeling that they think new opportunities have emerged due to the pandemic. So as you can see, most of these opportunities are involved around online and digital or a combination package program. So for the third question on the left, um, I have found differences between how different countries, institutions or governments have handled the disruption of study abroad due to COVID-19. This question showed that over half of the respondents felt there was a difference in how different countries handled this disruption, with the majority of them praising Queensland's swift response and action um, from student welfare, to frequent communication on what was happening in country. So not only has Queensland showcased the health safety aspect of having 
um, flatten the curve faster than most of our competitors. The government and institutions in Queensland are in the good books, so to speak. So this is a really good sign as it means when borders do open and the time comes for agents, these agents to start doing consultations um, to students on where you know, they should study abroad, they will most likely choose the destination they trust the most. So I wanted to thank you and please keep up the good work. Um, also a side note on this question to say that unsurprisingly, New Zealand was also similar um, here in terms of the high praise. So the fourth question on the right was, I believe the attitude of Japanese students towards studying abroad will change after COVID-19. So another optimistic result was that 42% of the responding agents um, responded positively and believe that the ad attitude of Japanese students towards studying abroad will either not change or be even higher after COVID-19. So this is shown in the red circle. Um, and even from a personal impression, uh, seeing the amount of inquiries that I have been receiving recently from schools and government agencies, Board of Education have been very encouraging. And lastly, um, so I also asked agents to list anything they would like the international education market to assist them with post COVID-19. So hopefully this list is informative for all of you, but they would like frequent and updated information on current situation in Queensland, especially on how school and campus life, life has changed now with new social distancing rules in place. So they would appreciate, they would also appreciate participation from Queensland institutions on some of their online information sessions. I'm sure this would not be too difficult now that everyone is used to using, you know, these kind of systems from working from home um, for so long. Another big one was um, to provide any promotional collateral such as videos from Queensland institutions and host families showing their enthusiasm on accepting Japanese students. So surprisingly, many schools have actually asked me this question on whether Queensland schools or host families are still, or, or would be too scared to accept foreign students anymore. So anything that would show them that um, you, they are still more than welcome, um, that would be really, really helpful. Um, another interesting comment was that, was on creating scholarships. So I know some institutions um, have put in place fee reductions or discounts on some of your courses, but just by calling these discounts a scholarship, apparently uh, changes the perspective and desirability of the program. So that was an interesting comment from some of the agents. Okay, so very positive responses from our education agents here in Japan. So from here, I would like to briefly touch on each sector. Um, as you can see, most of the challenges uh, around the uncertainty on when travel restrictions will be over, as it's proving difficult for Japanese institutions to plan for future programs. So as you may be aware, Japan loves to plan ahead of time. So I'm already receiving inquiries um, for term four and all through next year. And it's very difficult, obviously, for us to give any concrete advice on border restriction matters. So that has been really difficult um, to plan for them. Um, also, there are concerns over new social distancing rules, as I said, and self-isolation requirements that may, may be put in place even after borders are lifted. Obviously, the study tours in particular, the short-term ones will be really difficult if they were to come to Australia and had to self-isolate for two weeks. So they were hoping that there would be something in place where they would bring a, like a COVID free certificate um, so that they wouldn't have to do these self isolation. Um, so those are some of the things that we would have to think about. There is the obvious health concerns over the COVID-19 and there were a lot of comments. There have been a lot of comments on fee changes um, on courses. Uh, there's also still a perception in Japan of online learning being of lesser value compared to face-to-face -face lessons as well, um, as I'm sure most of our other Asian counterparts have expressed the same thing. Uh, some opportunities can be seen for new combination or package programs of online and offline offerings. Um, I know many of you probably see the shift to online courses as a temporary fix during these border closures, but I would really recommend and hope that uh, the online 
expertise that you have built during this time, which has been significantly better than Japan, by the way, um, that they don't go to waste and you can use that like as a value add for courses in the future. Um, for universities in particular, there may be a new market um, of students in Japan who are considering taking um, overseas online tertiary courses after leaving their Japanese university. So a recent statistic revealed that one out of 16 first year university students in Japan are actually considering dropping out of their university due to financial constraints, um, due to the loss of work by them or their parents um, due to COVID-19 and also due to the lack of confidence they have in the online delivery of their Japanese university. So once in Japan, once Japanese students drop out of university, it's extremely difficult to get back in. So once, you know, these financial situations, once their financial situation is better and they're in a position to think about tertiary education again, a potential course um, through an Australian university, uh, possibly studying online, would be a very attractive second option for them. For schools, um, there are challenges in the aforementioned digital literacy issue in Japan if things were to be offered online for the time being. But it seems that the demand for both study tours and longer term study abroad um, programs remain very high. I'm daily getting inquiries and questions about next programs next year. So I'm, if the borders do open, we're going to see a big spike increase in those programs. Um, so there are also many inquiries from Japanese schools wanting to form friendship schools um, with a focus on collaborating digitally. And for Elikos sector, there seems to be an increase in the demand for digital delivery of English teacher training programs as well. So in general, uh, Japanese students um, about slow have become more open to taking online courses through overseas institutions. Um, there are also increased opportunities for institutions to connect directly to potential uh, directly to potential students and schools than ever before um, through online information sessions, which give more credibility and authenticity to to traditional recruitment strategy. So I'm already getting a lot of inquiries through agents um, from schools that are wanting to hold. Um, sessions online for their students um, and have Queens institutions, overseas institutions come and present about their um, programs online. So I'm sure that wouldn't be a difficult thing um, to do um, at this point in time. So, and also existing partnerships that TIQ Japan has with Japanese government bodies have also brought about new opportunities which are now mostly being reshaped online can be a great new tool for many uh, Queensland institutions wanting to get back into the Japanese market uh, post COVID-19. So for tertiary institutions, the, the Diverse Link Tokyo Initiative with Tokyo Metropolitan Board of Education um, will be a really good program to participate in. And for schools, the vet sector and Elikos providers, uh, there is the programs uh, with potential programs with Tokyo Global Gateway, TGG, that we refer to. So please uh, don't hesitate to contact TAC or myself to see how your institution may be able to get involved in these programs. We'll be more than happy to talk to you and come up with some innovative programs digitally for now um, with these, the partnerships that we have um, with these partners. So importantly, also importantly, Australia and Queensland uh, has showcased its image successfully during this time as strict rules and safety procedures from the early onset of the pandemic has ultimately proved Queensland to being a safe house uh, compared to other parts of the world. Um, the smooth transition to online learning, which demonstrated the state's high quality technological resources, the generous international student welfare and support network that, that is happening throughout Queensland for the students at the moment who are, I guess, in studying in Queensland at the moment. Um, and the small time difference uh, between Japan, these all place Queensland in a very favourable place for future international 
um, education activities. Lastly, so what else can you as Queensland international education providers do at this time? So things like providing more platforms um, to promote your online courses, um, increasing your online presence, uh, providing online internship opportunities is something that comes up often at the moment. Um, use of virtual reality. So this particular photo I have used on the right um, is from when Study Cairns was in Japan last year. Um, also frequent communication uh, with your Japanese partners, whether they are institution or study agents through email or participation in the webinars and online information sessions. Um, are some of the many ways you can maintain your relationship with Japan to ensure a smooth transition back to a robust international um, education sector in the new future. So this session um, will be available to be viewed afterwards. And so we wel welcome any uh, feedback from particip participants in the survey that will be sent out um, later on, um, on where you would like us to focus on more in the next session, or if you would even like us to hold this session again, so that we can tailor the information to suit the needs of what you would like to know. So that is it for today. Thank you everybody for listening. Now, I think we would like to open this session up. We have just over 10 minutes um, for questions. So back to you, Tak. Thank you very much. Ooh, looks like we have received some questions. Tech, are you on? I'm just looking at the questions that we have received here. Yes. Hello. So, thank you, Yuri. So we've got a couple of questions. So first one, um, that's probably specific to you, Yuri. That's yep. the question regarding the agent survey that you have, uh, we have conducted, is that, a ta is that targeting a particular market segment such as school, vet and elicus or it targeting broader? Uh, yeah. So I sent out this survey to all of our agents focusing on Australia. So all of the market segments, um, including school, vet and elicus. Um, in this first survey, I didn't really get the chance to ask detailed questions, I guess, on each each sector, the, as, you, as you saw, the questions were quite broad. Um, some of these agents did kind of give me specific um, information on their particular sector, usually school um, and tertiary. But if, if this, these kind of surveys from agents are really valuable for, for you, and, and if you would like for me to do these surveys more and share it with you guys um, on different market segments, whether they're schools or vet, elicos, university, I'll be more than happy to, to do that and, and share these results with any, anyone who is interested. But, but this particular survey was a very broad one and it was only targeting agents uh, specifically looking at Australia as a destination. Um, so thank you for this question from Aaron. Okay. So here go quite a few more questions. Um, okay, so the next one. What is the Queensland government or TIQ Japan office uh, in terms of uh, what are we planning to do in terms of further promoting Queensland as a safe study destination in the post COVID era? I think Yuri, you touched upon a few um, ideas. Maybe do you want to sort of um, expand on those? Yeah, so as I said, I think Queensland actually has been doing really well so far. Most of, well, all of the respondents, um, the agent respondents and even schools that I've been talking to um, have expressed how, you know, Queensland is doing well. And even some of these students who are actually considering other destinations like US and Canada, um, have actually changed their mind to and changed their preferred destination to Australia. But as I said in the previous slides, um, these students and schools are quite worried about whether they are welcome still. Um, so in schools and in particularly with home homestays, so they're worried that you know they might be a little bit hesitant to have Asian students come into their homes. So if there is anything that 
you as destinations can provide for us any written collateral or even like a testimonial or a video um showcasing you know how you're how much you're um excited and you know waiting for japanese students to come we'll be happy to share this with all of our contacts um the agents will really really appreciate um these kind of collateral uh, that have come from the institutions through us and they'll be using this during their consultation with their students so we're already doing very well compared to to the other destination all of our competitors so i'd really like to keep this momentum going and so that you know once the borders do open all of these students will have it'll be a given to go to australia basically okay good thanks siori um quite a few questions coming through so the next one is probably a more comment so if he, um yeah some of the uh, clients are looking to uh, receive the data that we, if we can share for individual sectors that surveys and stuff so that's fine i think that the powerpoint will be uh, uploaded online later yeah, i believe uh, it will be uploaded onto youtube but if you would like me to share more of the details on the comments especially with the agent surveys um obviously i couldn't comment on i couldn't include all the comments that have come um through mm -hmm. so if you would like to receive more detailed responses from me, please don't hesitate to, to ask. I'll be more than happy to share. Right, okay. The, the next one. With, um, with ICT usage in the cl classroom, do you think university students are more familiar with using technology um, in the classroom um, and for study? university students more familiar with using technology in the class classroom and yes, yes. <laughs> so you will be very surprised at how many students actually were stuck without a laptop or wi-fi connections at home it was it was a very big deal in japan a lot of universities and schools they couldn't start their online um learning um, for the first few weeks um, in Japan. But as I, I, as I mentioned, the, the sales in laptops increased significantly in Japan during the COVID. So this means, I mean, I, I don't know the latest statistics, but I would be very confident that now all 100% of the university students in Japan would have had experience now doing some online lessons um, using some of them may be using their their smartphones but i'm pretty confident that a lot of them are now a little less um hesitant i guess to use laptops um at home and also they may now things might change and it might be that they'll bring their laptops um into into school now to use that use that in the classroom um once the lessons um come back a lot of the universities are still closed um, the campuses are out of bounds so a lot of the universities um, are still doing online lessons through zoom um, so yes sorry my long answer to your question but yes the i think that the university students are way more familiar with using technology um, in the classroom and for study yeah just to add to that um yuri i think needs to have a bit of a uh, a break for <laughs> 15 questions in a row um, from because sometimes when we're talking to universities in Japan and we are surprised at how quickly they have adapted to this online situation. Like for example, Tokyo University, um, they got the huge IT department in a central uh, office and they, you know, reviewed all the technologies, including Zoom and Teams and they re I think as a university, they decided officially to adopt the uh, Zoom for all the lectures and then they are delivering lectures online as well. So I think that um, yeah, Japan's needed to do a lot of catch up, but I think um, some are obviously it's not going to be for everybody. I think some will catch up and adapt to the new, uh, new normal very quickly there will be the survivors and then others who probably struggle obviously you know um, the situ same situation in many other markets the next question i think this is something i can start to answer it's the question about financial incentives like um tobitate uh, for those who, who remember uh, a few years ago japanese government uh incentivized the japanese students to go overseas 
um, uh, to study abroad, right? So if there is anything uh, like that is being provided by the uh, some level of Japanese government, uh, I'm sure this question is probably in, in relation to online education. I think Yori and I had an interesting sort of a discussion with a couple of um, Japanese uh, a board of educations and uh, prefectural governments in the recent weeks. And we were surprised that some of them are already talking about um, coming up with a, a special budget for online education as a key uh, focus. So, um, so that's, that's in terms of online education, I think that, uh, that there's a strong recognition, I think at the uh, uh, regional levels uh, at least to uh, to look at it and uh, the and the need for uh, funding those activities. Uh, you were doing a, a, anything else on that? Yes, I completely agree. A lot of the um, the board of educations are now looking at obviously looking at their budget to see if there's anything um, we can do with them. They're putting budgets in place, so obviously we're talking to a lot of these uh, board of education at the moment. We had a discussion this week um, with with a few. Um, to see if there are any scope of doing doing some combination programs with them, so that would really help uh, for us to tap into kind of their budget. So, um, but we'll we'll be keeping a very close eye on um, on these kind of developments, and we'll be happy to we'll be sharing these uh, with you um, as these come up. We only have two minutes, by the way, and we do have a lot of questions that have come. Thank you very much. Just letting you know that we will be downloading these questions um, later on we'll, and we'll be getting back to all of you um, at a later date um, for some of these questions. I just wanted to, I, I see the um, comment from Jacinta as well um, about the TGG programs that you're doing. I'm, I'm, very, I'm well aware of the, the extremely uh, successful program that EQI has been doing with, with TGG and at the moment with TGG being closed until I think, uh, September or October, um, you're looking at doing some online courses there. So that, that's very, very good news. And it shows how, you know, Japanese schools and institutions, um, are, you know, very willing to bring in these kind of digital resources now um, into their programs, um, as you saw how low the take up was before COVID-19. So it's really good for us to see this changing in Japan as well, which is only going to be very good for Queensland. Yeah, thanks, uh, Yuri. There are a couple of questions regarding the borders. Um, so I just, probably that's the one last one I just wanted to quickly address. Um, there has been a lot of media talk uh, reports in Japan on the, on the possibility of, from the Japanese government point of view, uh, considering Australia as one of the first group of countries that um, they, the Japan wants to open the border uh, for, uh, I think initially they're talking about the critical, you know, the business uh, traffic uh, people and and so on. But I mean, I think the students obviously are 14 days self quarantine, all that sort of stuff. I think it's we need to see how this um, pans out. Obviously, from where we where we are, we'd like to see um, um, the international students will be. Um, considered uh, as a next, next you know, priority um, because I think this is a, um, you know, between Japan and Australia relationship, relationship has been very good. And um, I think it's, um, you know, um, it's one of the things I'm sure that's been discussed between uh, two countries. So on that note, I'd like to um, conclude by saying thank you for, for your time and listening for a full hour. And as you already mentioned, the, the questions, all the, the, the rest of the question will be answered uh, privately uh, later. And, um, and this will be recorded as well. So um, on the note, um, I thank you for, for this opportunity and I look forward to welcoming you to another uh, uh, study Queensland series later on for other markets. So thank you. Thank you, everyone.